All right, so this talk is, about, is going to be about the Finagle ecosystem, uh, especially how it works at Twitter. So hopefully for people who don't know that much about Finagle, this will be interesting, but also for people who use maybe some of the features but not all of them, it'll be interesting. And for people who use all of the features, um, Finagle has a lot of features, so you probably don't use all the features. Um, OK, so um, I'm Moses Nakamura. I'm on the core systems libraries team at Twitter, which owns Finagle and Util and Ostrich and Scrooge and Twitter server and all these things. Um, so. Uh, just a little bit, of, a little bit of background. Uh, Finagle is an extensible RPC framework. Uh, basically, the premise is, uh, way back in the day, we were looking to doing a bunch of stuff in Scala with a bunch of different protocols. We wanted to go hit memcached. We wanted to go hit thrift. We wanted to, or we wanted to do stuff in thrift. We wanted to uh, go hit Redis and use HTTP. And we found that uh, basically all RPC was sort of fundamentally very similar. Um, and so we could sort of have this very generic library which, um, in which you implement like one feature like load balancing for Redis, and now you also have load balancing for memcached. Um, and it turns out that often you want them to work very similar ways. Um, so it turns out that being able to have everything work on the same system, where we just say like, oh, well, this looks sort of like this other thing, except like, uh, our like service, which is a finagle abstraction, I'll go over later. Uh, this service is like hitting memcached instead, and um, this makes it much easier to reason about all of your systems. So having this set of core abstractions that everyone uses across the company when they're building real-time systems makes it a lot easier for people to say like, oh, I'm having trouble like understanding what's going on when I'm like hitting your remote si system, but I can go and look at the code and see, oh, you're using finagle in this one way, and uh, understand exactly what's going on. So, um, because we have these shared abstractions that everyone in the company is using, we're able to sort of build things on top of them. And so we have sort of a Finagle ecosystem where if you're using Finagle, then you can also get these things not quite for free necessarily. Some of them are for free, but you don't necessarily have to do a ton of work to add them on. Like sometimes you'll have to add something to your class path, or you'll have to set up like a remote service so that when you're sending information somewhere, it has somewhere to live. Um, so one example is every Finagle service is going to have stats. Um, so now when we're trying to help someone debug something and they've somehow managed to turn off stats, which is generally pretty unlikely, we can say, oh, can you turn on stats instead of, oh, can you go and like instrument your entire service to use stats so it's like possible to understand what's going, what it's doing at all. Um, that kind of thing has been a big win for us. Um, all right, so here are the sort of core abstractions of Finagle. Uh, there's service, server, and client. Um, basically, uh, this is, it occurs to me not everyone in this audience knows Scala, Scala super well. Basically, what's going on here is we have um, this abstraction called a service. And all it is, it's basically a function that goes from a request to a future response. So we agree that. Uh, basically, I can pass it a request object, and then at some point in time in the future, I'll be able to get a response back from it. Um, and this just represents like something that's going to do an RPC. Um, theoretically, it doesn't have to be an RPC, and it should be completely transparent what's actually going on. Um, so it shouldn't matter um, to like it, this could be something that's run locally even and just doesn't matter to me. Um, so later on, I could say like, oh, well, I'm going to swap out this service, which is just a function, which goes from request to a future response uh, that's run locally with something that actually goes and does a network call. Um, so then we have the server abstraction, which basically exports the service to the network. So one way you can think about this is um, I'm going to open a socket and um, uh, just have the service sitting like behind the socket. So you send me requests through the socket, and uh, I'll be able to send you back responses. So um, you can see like when you want to serve something, you say, "Here's the socket address I'm going to serve it at," and then here's the service that I want to actually have that hand handle the requests, and then I get this thing called listening server back. Um, 
And then the question is, well, how do you actually send requests to the server? And the answer is with a client. So clients are things that import services off a network. So after you export the service to the network with the server, you can then import it off the network with the client. And then based on this client, you say, well, I know there's a service that has a name, like I want to hit like the user service or something like that. And um, I'm going to give it some label, like uh, user service or something like that. And then I'll be able to get this service back, which I can then use locally as if it was just local, even if it's not. Those are basically the core finagle abstractions. Um, going back to stats, which I mentioned before, um, we collect stats on like every single request. Um, so um, if you want to go and like try to debug like what's going on with the service or is the service healthy or not, you can go and you can say, well, um, right now uh, my like 99 percentile request latency is not so hot. It's taking me 100 milliseconds. I expect it to take two milliseconds. Um, probably something is going wrong. Um, because everything is using Finagle, um, and Finagle has this stuff built into it, um, and everything uses the same core service abstraction, we can just add, like, uh, like without any effort, basically have it export stats. Um, so sort of why you want to do stats for more information, metrics, metrics, the talk metrics, metrics, metrics everywhere by Coda Hale is a pretty good talk. Um, another big thing, or another big win for us was distributed tracing. So basically, sort of the idea behind distributed tracing is um, we have a bunch of different services that are all talking to each other. Um, and so when a request comes into Twitter, you can imagine first it goes and hits like um, sort of a front end, which like is actually facing the public internet. And then the front end goes and sends it to, well, someone is trying to tweet something new, so it goes and sends it to uh, the first service, which goes and like increments some stats that we're going to use later for something for like analytics, and then also goes and like writes something, and then also goes and like updates someone who like really cares about it, um, and does all these different things. And it could be that uh, one of these things is like really slowing down your entire system. Uh, because you can't respond until this one thing has gotten back to you. Um, and this can help you find like bottlenecks or like um, uh, figure out like where your long tail latency is coming from, which is something we care about a lot. Um, so basically the premise is that you're going to sample a very small number of your requests um, and just send information back to um, this uh, service, which the one that we built is called Zipkin. And it's open source if you're curious, um, which will collect all of these spans and then let you query them uh, later. So, um, yeah, basically profiling is useful if you just want to see like, um, okay, why is this like why is this specific piece of my system like doing poorly? You can just go and profile the crap out of it, and it's, you see like, oh well, this thing is doing a ton of system calls, so it's always going to be slow. Um, but if something like very occasionally d does it very poorly, then tracing can be good to figure that out because you're going to be sampling some of your actual real live traffic. So distributed tracing is actually not that easy to implement if all of your services are like sort of built in like a different sort of hodgepodge way. If they're all sort of like super artisanal, like, oh, this one uses this technology, this one uses this technology. Um, like, um, it's become sort of complicated to sort of say like, oh, well, these are all sort of the same semantic request which came in from this user. Um, and because they're all, they might be on different machines and they're almost certainly on different JVMs, um, you need to be able to sort of pass information about like it being semantically the same request th and thread that through the system. Anyway, so everything being on Finagle means that we can change the protocol slightly and just say like everyone agrees that we're going to be sending things back in the same way. Um, so here's an example. Um, you can sort of see like we have some good stuff in it. This is something that Zipkin generates. So there's like uh, these. Uh, this one seems like maybe this one might be blocking these, um, which might be desirable. But it could also be that there's just an oversight and someone's accidentally doing a blocking call um, when 
they should have been just getting these in parallel, which could have sped things up a little bit. OK, cool. Um, another example is like pipelining. So uh, we added pipelining for memcache, and then it turned out, well, Redis also has pipelining. Uh, so we can also get pipelining basically for free in Redis, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, service discovery. So because um, like one way of uh, handling, like I have one service, which is like I have the user service, which is talking to like the tweet service in order to construct timelines. Um, one way you could go about doing this is you just say, I know exactly what hosts everything is living on, and you just have like really long lists of hosts and just sort of dump them into big files. Um, and that's fine. It's like great. Um, but it could also be nice to be able to have like service discovery so you can see, oh, like the service is like come online, is like announcing, I'm ready to uh, say things. So we said previously that servers give you back listening servers. And um, listening servers have this API which lets you announce. And you say, I'm going to announce, I'm going to announce that I'm a user service and I'm like open for business, come at me. Um, so, um, because everything is on this sort of shared abstraction, everything can also uh, share the service discovery stuff, which has made our lives a lot easier. Um, so internally, we use Zookeeper right now. Um, or internally, we use Zookeeper right now for basically everything. Uh, you could also use um, another system, like I think there's MDNS support. Um, and if you want, you can just use INET. Um, so what's next in the Finagle ecosystem? Um, basically, like the biggest thing that's on the horizon is MUX, which is a new protocol that you can layer on top of other protocols. So right now, sort of the reference implementation is Thrift MUX. Um, and this is sort of uh, similar to the distributed tracing thing that we mentioned before, where we can pass a little bit of extra information with, with, each, with each of our requests and say, oh, well, with this thrift request to this downstream service, like we're going to pass also like a trace ID. Um, Mux also lets us do sort of more interesting things when different services are communicating. Um, so um, here's a few of the things that Mux is going to help us with. So basically, it's going to have a discard command, which lets you say, I no longer care about this data. So it could be that I say, OK, I'm going to do this very expensive request. And then uh, my upstream says, wait, if you took too long, I've already responded with like degraded data. I don't care about your expensive requests anymore. And I say, oh, great. I don't have to do my expensive requests anymore. Um, right now, the way that's implemented is we just kill the connection. Um, killing connection is not great. Um, we typically assume that you don't kill connections very frequently. So um, we, haven't heavily, we haven't heavily optimized like, um, how much, GC, how much uh, GC pressure that'll give you. Um, so if it turns out that you start uh, having to send a bunch of interrupts, then which are basically just connection closes, then you'll suddenly have a lot of connection churn and then, therefore a lot of GC pressure. Um, so discarding uh, where you just send a message through your connection, which you can keep alive, that just says, oh, I don't care about this piece of information, makes it a lot easier. Um, then there's leasing, which we'll discuss more later, about which more later. Um, there's multiplexing, so basically, um, for Thrift, which doesn't support this out of the box, you'll be able to uh, basically send a ton of different requests through the same connection and receive the, uh, responses to them out of order, um, uh, which will basically get rid of all of your connection pooling woes. Um, then better error encoding, ping for better liveness, uh, draining for letting you like drain things more cleanly. Um, or drain services more cleanly, and initialization also for liveness. Um, so with error encoding, this is going to give us stuff like, um, uh, let's say I know that I'm sending back an error through thrift, and uh, we can theoretically add something where I just parse like the first couple bytes, and I know immediately this is an error, and do something like say, I don't care about parsing the rest of it. I'm just going to handle this in a special way. Um, Draining basically lets us have like much cleaner um, uh, shutdowns of services um, so that people will say, okay, I know the service is draining, I'm going to stop sending requests to it um, and just like wait for responses. Um, but this also means that when a service wants to shut down, it doesn't have to just like start ignoring a bunch of requests. 
Um, uh, mentioned multiplexing before. Um, yeah, discarding, very cool. Um, so with leasing, so the big exciting thing about leasing is GC avoidance. Um, so basically the premise is um, sometimes we're on the JVM, sometimes your JVM has to do a GC. It's a super bummer. Um, GCs are like pretty slow. Uh, they can be like five milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. Like if you get a serial GC, maybe like seconds. It's like pretty much the end of the world. Uh, it increases your long tail latency significantly. So basically like we can, we can say, oh, I'm probably going to do a GC soon. Stop talking to me. I don't care. Like, don't talk to me. Um, and this means that our long tail latency will be significantly improved on like every single service that respects these. And because Finagle will have this built in soon, um, we'll improve our long tail latency across like our entire cluster, like pretty much for free, like which is pretty cool. Um, then this is going to be something that's improved by or helped with Mux. Basically, you can go to uh, twitter.github.io. Twitter slash finagle, um, which has interesting docs. We have a Google group. Uh, we're on GitHub. There's docs. Take a look at GitHub issues. Um, if you have any questions, I'm on Twitter and GitHub.